up your Bibles this evening to 1 Samuel chapter 17. Put your finger there and then flip over to 2 Kings chapter 6. Sorry to make it so complicated. There's a story of a war, um, a man of war who was in the foxhole with his, um, with his co-soldiers. I don't know how you would say it. And uh, someone asked him this question as the bullets are whizzing over their head, as they're facing death day by day, minute by minute. Why is it that he is so cool and calm and collected? Why is it that you are not afraid? And he said, because the God that I serve will protect me if he wants me to live, and he'll take me if he wants to take me, regardless of if it's in this foxhole or sometime after this war. And he understood something, that he had forces in heaven who looked out for him, who cared for him, and would protect him if it wasn't his time. So for us as Christians, we can have this same encouragement that we have heavenly reinforcements that are watching out for us on a daily basis and will protect us as we desire to carry out God's will. So let's read our text, the one in 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 15 through 17. Now in this text, the Syrian army is coming against this city, and they're seeking to kill the prophet Elisha. And the text says, when the servant of, uh, of the man, this is Elisha's servant, uh, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elisha prayed, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, Behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4, it says, And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Let's pray. Father God, we ask, Lord, tonight, God, that your Holy Spirit would minister to the people in this place, God, that it wouldn't be my words or my wisdom or whatever I might lean on, God, but I fully and entirely rely on you, Father. I hide behind the cross, God. We ask, Lord, that you would go to the place that no man can go, into the hearts and souls of the people in this place. And Lord, that no one would leave this place untouched and unchanged by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, these two passages of scriptures are two different stories, obviously. And we will be kind of paralleling them in an aspect um, that will draw something out kind of in the end. So just bear with me on that front. Oftentimes we can look at our circumstances in our lives and we can have our faith blinded by these circumstances. Seemingly impossible circumstances, Elisha's servant saw with his natural eyes a very real problem. I can just imagine, you know, it says very early in the morning, so, you know, he's stumbling out of bed, throws his blinds open, and he's like, what, you know, what? Oh, crap. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people, and they're coming after us. You know, so he sees this issue. He sees that there is a very real problem. There was, a, it, no doubt, a very real problem. Their lives were in danger, and we as Christians have the tendency to look at our problems through the eyes of man rather th than through the eyes of God. Now, if we think about the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17... It's a very common story. Most of us here probably know it. The Philistines are the enemies of God's people. And I'm not talking about a country that is, happens to be in war with them over some political interests. You read through the Old Testament, and the Philistines are always the enemies of God's people. This isn't just a, a situational thing where we were friends once, now we're not, and we'll be friends later. This is constant throughout the Old Testament, that the Philistines are not just a physical but a moral and literal enemy of God's people. So these Philistines, they come and they march to the edge of Israel, Israel's territory, and they basically start talking smack. They're standing at the battle line and they're, they're calling them out. They're talking trash. And then 
out comes Goliath. And then, and then the story of Goliath starts here. 1 Samuel 17, 4 through 7. It says, There out of the camp came uh, of the Philistines the champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And for those of you who don't measure your stuff in cubits, that's about nine feet, nine inches. That's tall. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with the coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And again, if you don't weigh things in shekels, that's about 125 pounds. Imagine wearing a 125-pound jacket. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. And the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, about 15 pounds. And his shield bearer went before him. So this dude's big. That's the gist of what we just read. He's a big boy. And uh, just as a side note, you can look at archaeological findings and history of men this big. This isn't a myth story. This is reality. This actually happened. So this guy, nine feet, nine inches tall, he makes Shaq look like a child. You all, you all know who Shaq is, right? <laughs> I mean, even Shaq coming against this guy on the, on the battle lines, Goliath is going like this on his head and Shaq swinging at him. This is a big guy. Okay, so Goliath comes out and he starts talking trash to Israel. He, start, he starts dissing on their God. He start, probably made fun of their mamas, it's just not in the Bible. 1 Samuel 17, 8 through 11 says, He stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel, why have, uh, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves. And let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. It says they were dismayed and greatly afraid. What might be going through their minds in this moment? You know, they're facing up this guy, and they know that they got to stand up for their people, right? But they're all too scared to do it. You know, they might be thinking, God, why do I have to die in this situation? Does it have to be me? How could you let this happen to us? Why us? These are all questions that we might find ourselves asking God as we encounter our own giants in life, our own situations in life, our own seemingly impossible circumstances. We find ourselves surrounded by troubles, and we ask God, why didn't you give me a giant? You see, Israel didn't have giants of their own. Israel had a bunch of normal dudes. God didn't give Israel a giant because he wanted them to have faith in their giant God. Their true conqueror was God. It was not a giant. If God gave us fair resources in all of our circumstances, then it gives us too much of an opportunity to claim the glory for ourselves. If we have a fair fight, then we can give ourselves too much credit. God desires to move through unlikely sources. That's been the way he worked since the very beginning, and it continues to today. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. This is to show God's might, not ours. So if you're thinking today you're feeling kind of like a weak fool, but you love Jesus, guess what? You're in a prime position to be used by God. I pretty much feel that way every day. When we begin to look at ourselves as wise and strong, we find ourselves unrighteously elevating ourselves above the others around us. Philippians 2.3 says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Unrighteously elevating ourselves above our own authorities rather than... Oh, sorry, I moved on to my next point. Jesus says to count ourselves less than those around us. Jesus did the same thing by serving the people around him. That's what this is talking about. You do everything 
considering other people more significant than yourself. Other people's needs come before yours. This is ministry. This is what Jesus calls his people to do. And then we can unrighteously elevate ourselves above our own authorities, whether it be governing authority or within the church or within our workplace, whatever it might be. Titus 3.1 says, Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. That's what this is talking about. We might not always like our authorities. You might have a boss and you don't like them. But guess what? God gave you that job, Amen. which means he gave you that authority, which means he challenges you to submit to that authority. Amen. And worst of all, we can unrighteously elevate ourselves above God. And this was the sin of Satan, thinking he was hot stuff and eventually found himself stuck in a fiery situation because of his own pride, because he thought, I can be better than that guy. I want the praise for myself. You see, we are the weak and the foolish who God wants to rise up. I'm not saying we should run around, you know, demeaning ourselves, calling ourselves dumb, calling ourselves fools. But rather, we should remember who we once were and remember that we are a new creation because of Christ and Christ alone. It is Christ who's done what he's done in us so far, and it's Christ who will bring us to future victories as well. We are who God desires to use. And any wisdom and strength we have is completely and entirely from God. Now, returning to the story of David and Goliath, it was 40 days in a row that Goliath came out and threw insults at Israel, day after day. And it was 40 days that Israel cowered in fear of this man, doing nothing about it. Now, here comes David. We don't know how big David was, although a lot of people portray him as small. There's no actual biblical evidence of that. But he was young. Most scholars believe he was only about 15 to 19 years old. Just a kid. He comes along. He wasn't part of Israel's military. He was actually bringing food to his brothers who were in the military. And he hears what Goliath has to say. And he doesn't like it. He told them, he said, how can you let this guy talk to the army of the living God? That's what he understood. We, this isn't just some group of men with swords and shields. This is the army of the living God. And you can't let this guy talk to you that way. That's what he was telling these people. So word gets back to King Saul that David's kind of stirring some things up, maybe even causing a little bit of trouble. You know, we see in the story that his brothers get kind of mad at him. So he's calling them out. So Saul sends for King David to confront him about this whole thing. And we find the situation in 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 37. David says to Saul, let no man's heart because, fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. So Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight him. You are but a youth, and he has been a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by the beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who has delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. You see, David, just being a little kid, that's, that's what he was, he was a teenager, understood that the Lord gave him victory in the past, and the Lord would give him victory again. Now they tried to give David some armor and a sword and a shield to use, and it just didn't quite fit right. Back in the day, you know, the, you had to put it on, you had to test it out, you had to practice in it, make sure there wasn't anything that would lock up for your body and all that stuff. It was a situation. It took time to do. And they tried to give him something he'd never worn before, and he says, you know what? I don't need that stuff. I got God. I'm going to do this the way I did it before. So he grabs his staff, he grabs his sling, and he collects five stones and marches toward Goliath. 
Now, some commentators believe he picked five stones because Goliath had four brothers. He was ready f- to throw down. But we don't know that for sure, but I like to think that's what it is. First Samuel 17, 41 through 47. It says, And the Philistine moved, toward, uh, moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth ruddy and handsome in his appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut you off and cut off your head. And I will give to I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines this day to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all his assembly may know the, that the Lord saves, not with sword and spear. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. That's some good trash talk right there. And you all know how the story ends, but just in case you don't, they start charging at each other. David pulls a rock out, throws in his sling. One shot kill. It was a quick fight. Tell you what, if that was one of those pay-per-views that people pay for, you know, and you get to the main event and it's over like that, people are disappointed. But that's the way it went. One rock straight to the forehead knocked him down. Game over. The entire army of soldiers looked at their enemy. The Israel army looked at their enemy and saw the situation for what it was in the flesh. They saw a big dude that they couldn't overpower on their own. But when David showed up, he saw things a little bit differently. He knew that it wasn't about his might and his strength, but it was about God, the power of God that could overcome these situations. And in seemingly impossible circumstances, David prevailed because he realized that he had a God who brought the victory, not because David brought the victory. Now back to the other story. Elisha saw this as an opportunity to lead his servant into a greater faith. He prayed for him and revealed to him that there was armies on the mountainside, heavenly armies that he didn't see before. And this is the difference between discipleship and just being a preacher. Elisha saw things differently than his servant did. He understood there was heavenly forces at work. He understood that there was a powerful God who could move in this impossible situation. And instead of just showing off what God would do next, he decided to show this man and reveal to him that God's power was at work and that he could see it for himself. You see, Elisha understood something, that even though God had used him, he could use his servant and other people as well. You know, he could have very easily been like, "Eh, watch this kid, and then just did his thing without praying that God would reveal to him the power of God that was on that mountainside that day. But instead, he prayed that his eyes would be open, that he could see the hope, that he could see the power of God that was around him. Because he understood that Elisha, being one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, served the same God that this man did. And that's what I tell people a lot when they, when they ask me to pray for them about something. And don't get me wrong, I'm willing to pray for people. But I remind them, These requests, these things, these situations that you pray about, that you need prayer for, I pray to the same God that you do. And God listens to me just like he listens to you. I'm not special. I mean, I'm special in God's eyes, don't get me wrong, but you are just as special. I'm not more special than anybody here. I'm a child of God, and so are you. And the Father listens to his children. So Elijah used this as a learning opportunity for his servant. Instead of letting pride set in and telling him, step back, kid, watch this. 
That's a dangerous type of mentality. You see, Elisha was mentored by Elijah, two very similar names, two different men. Imagine if Elijah had that, had that mentality. Step back and watch this, kid. But no, Elijah desired a double portion for Elisha. He said, you can do everything I did and then some. That's what leadership is. And that's what Elisha did for his servant. Now going back to David, he killed Goliath in front of all of Israel's army. They all saw it happen. And the reality is that David defeated Goliath when it probably should have been King Saul who fought him all along. You see, you read the stories of Saul, and it says that King Saul was the tallest man in all of Israel, at least one head taller than anybody else. So you look at this situation where this big dude, Goliath, nine feet nine inches, is calling somebody out. Logic would indicate that you send your biggest dude, and that was King Saul. You see, King Saul decided to cower in fear, and the rest of his army followed suit. I don't doubt that if King Saul had the faith that King David, a future King David did, that he would have been in that situation and he could have defeated Goliath. And you read through the stories of Saul as king, and he actually never killed any giants, and neither did any of his men. They did have some pretty impressive feats. You can read about them in the Bible. They did a lot of amazing things empowered by God. But David later on became king of Israel. He made his statement, his first statement in the nation of Israel by killing Goliath in front of an entire army. But King David didn't stop there. He didn't tell his men, you know what, I'm the giant slayer, I got this, back up. King David was empowered by God, and he instilled that same confidence in his men so that they could have victory through God as well. And you read through the stories of King David and his warriors. He had a special group of people called the 30. Simple name. Pretty cool, though. It was actually 37 guys, but you know how that stuff goes. The 37 doesn't have a ring to it. This was basically Israel's special forces. And I'll tell you what, guys. If there's ever been superheroes in actual world history, it's these guys right here. Like, you read the stuff that they did, and it's crazy. You're like, there's no way. But that's the power of God. I'll let you guys read that on your own time. So now I got you curious. (laughs) You see, David defeated giants. And he showed his men that they could too. You read the stories of these men, the 30. And they slayed giants. Not just David. There were other giants. Like I said, King David had four brothers. Or not King David. Goliath had four brothers. (laughs) I'm glad I caught that. King David had six brothers, just so you guys know. (laughs) No, seven. No, I'm just kidding. Read it and find out. Goliath had four brothers. All of them ended up dead at the hands of Israelites. There were other giants in the camps of the Philistines as well. You can read the stories of how big they were, how strong they were, how many fingers they had. Some of them had six fingers. But they slayed them. Not just King David, but King David and his men. Because David understood, it's not David. It's God. And you guys have access to the same power that I do. We have to be able to look at the examples of victory in God that we see in our lives and the lives around us and believe that God can bring us that victory too. And we have to show the same confidence for ourselves when we find ourselves in victory to other people that they can find that same victory as well. See, we don't have to rely on our own strength and ability because we have heavenly reinforcements. That's a relief because I'm not that strong and I'm not that able. We are protected and empowered by God, by heavenly reinforcements. Now going back to Elisha and his servant, when Elisha's servant could see the horses and the chariots of fire, He could see and he could understand that they were protected by God in this situation. And when the armies of Israel and David saw David defeat Goliath, they were reminded that they were an army that served God and they were protected by God. 
You know, it was um, just last week when we were outreaching, Brother Gio goes, man, you shouldn't be on these streets, but you're walking around so confidently. (laughs) And I'm like, I don't know, man. It's just, I got God. God's on my side. And, you know, it's funny, when I first started outreaching, the Pastor Renee, he would like to go to neighborhoods like that a lot. And I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was a little nervous. <laughs> you know, I was, I was uncertain. I wasn't as confident as I am now. But as time went on, I realized that when you're doing God's work, God's protection goes with you. So you and I were able to walk through neighborhoods like that confident, knowing that we're out there marching with God. It's like the song we sang this, this morning, Emmanuel, we're marching in your name. Emmanuel is a name for Jesus that literally means God with us. When we're marching on the front lines for God's army, we know that he's right there with us in the battle, on the front lines. Second Thessalonians verses th- uh, chapter 3, verses 3 and 5 says, For the Lord is faithful, he will establish you and guard you against the evil one. May the Lord direct your heart to the love of God and to the steadfastness of Christ. Our faithfulness in God is always met by God's faithfulness to us. And the two stories we looked at today, David and Goliath and Elisha and the heavenly army, represent two different confrontations that we face as Christians. You see there's some symbolism here. Israel and the Philistines, like I said earlier, represent spiritual warfare. These weren't just two nations that had an issue that were trying to work things out or didn't want to work things out, so they were fighting instead. These were enemies from the beginning and continue to be enemies today. The same people that are coming against Israel are these people right here. This is more than just a fight of the flesh. This is spiritual warfare. And when we engage in spiritual warfare, we fight to destroy. That's what God can do. Now the story of Elisha and the heavenly army represents our confrontation with people. This is a very different type of confrontation. It reminds us of Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, leading into the, uh, the armor of God. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now this is the important part. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. This is people. We don't fight against people, but against the rulers and the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We don't fight against people. We're fighting against the evil that controls the people. We're fighting against the evil that oppresses these people. We're fighting against the evil that tries to oppress us. This is where the battle is. And the difference is this. In the spiritual realm, we fight for keeps. The devil is our true enemies and he's after our souls. But like I said, the verse says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We're not here on this earth to fight people. We're here to reach people for Christ and to love people even when they claim to be our enemies. You see, the rest of the story of Elisha and the heavenly army has a very interesting ending. 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 17 says, And Elisha prayed to the Lord, O Lord, please open the eyes that he, uh, that, that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Now you read this part of the portion, and you're thinking, oh man, I see where this is going. This is about to get good. But then what does Elisha do next? He prays that God would strike the Syrians blind. And God strikes them blind. And you're thinking, man, this is going to be even easier than I thought. It's game over. But then Elisha goes out and he confronts them and he says, this is not the way, this is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And you're thinking, what is he doing here? So he leads them, he leads these men to the heart of Israel, right up to the king of Israel. So he has his enemies, they're blind, they're within his city gates. And right now you're thinking, oh man, he's got them. Game over, this is, this is going to be like shooting fish in a barrel. 
But let's see what happens next. 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king saw Israel, uh, king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? He answered, You shall not strike them down. Would you strike down those who you, whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go their way to their master. So he prepared for them a great feast. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went their way to their master. And the Syrians did not come again on raids to the land of Israel. So instead of killing them, which you would think that's the direction the story is going, right? It's easy victory. They're all blind. They have no idea where they are. They have no idea what's going on. Instead of just taking them all down, chopping them down, Elisha prays for them, for their eyesight to be restored, and they prepare for them a great feast, and then they send them on their way. That's kind of crazy. This is the love of Christ. That not only would we spare our enemies, but that we love them, we feed them, and we clothe them. You see, the reality is, we were all once enemies of Christ, but he died for us. Romans 5, 8 says, But God shows his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And Romans 5, 10 says, For while we were still enemies, why we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. You see, though we were once enemies of Christ, he died for us. He won us over by loving us, even though we were sinners. He had every right to strike us down in our sin, dead and rotten in our ways, but instead, he loved us. He came to earth and he served people. And he calls us as Christians to do the same thing. Matthew 5, 44 through 45, Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. We rely on our heavenly reinforcements to come against evil. And we rely on God and his angels to come against and fully defeat evil in spiritual warfare in our lives. But we rely on Christ to win over people who dislike us by using us to love them and to show Christ's love to these people. But in both areas, we must rely on God and his help to find victory in these battles. Can I have every head bowed and every eyes closed?